Good day, everyone, and welcome to this session. You've seen the title. It's by Rob Engel, who never needs any introduction with 150,000 citations and an H index greater than 100. I presume everybody who's listening in actually knows all about him. However, just to reiterate, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2003 for his research on ARCH, sharing the prize with Clive, who got it for co-integration and acquired too many honors to mention. He's helped develop both co-integration, common features, ultra-aggressive conditional duration, caviar, dynamic correlation, and conditional correlation models, et cetera. We've known each other for more than 50 years, so he's probably bored to death of my introducing him. But in any case, his talk today is going to be about climate change and financial risk. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A and they'll be taken up later. Over to you, Rob. I'm muted. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm sitting in New York, and it's wonderful to be able to uh, to, to join you all in in uh, in London, I guess, and wherever wherever you are. So it's uh, you know nice to see old friends. Um, so what I thought I would talk about today is uh, the work that we're doing at the Volatility and Risk Institute on measuring climate risk and what its implications are for uh, financial asset pricing and investors. And uh, so I have a series of things to, to, uh, to show you. And uh, let me begin by, by sharing my screen. So uh, the, uh, the title that I've actually put on the slide is a little bit different from what was advertised, but it's, it, it's descriptive. We're gonna talk about climate financial risk and in particular implications for portfolios and stress tests. Um, so just as a starter, let me show you the volatility map of the world, which uh, is on, on VLAB and is updated every day. Uh, I said this is today, but it actually, I think is last week. Um, and you see green is where countries have low equity volatilities. Uh, red is where they're high. And it's obviously a very green map, but it isn't always like that. Um, a year ago, that is in, in March of 2020, the map was extraordinarily red. And this was when the, the heart of the pandemic. If you look right after Brexit, you see it's uh, mostly red, especially in the European uh, region and, and, and a lot of the European trading partners. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna talk about today is the, um, the risks of climate change, but this is not the only risk that we're facing. We're facing COVID risk, we're facing recessions, and actually you could expand this picture uh, in, in a lot of ways as well. So we wanna discuss also the idea that these risks don't come one at a time, and how are we going to think about measuring that sort of thing. Um, so a starting point is to ask, what are the biggest shocks that we've actually observed in the past? And what is it that we want to, the risks that we want to be most prepared for? Um, and what do I mean by shocks that shake the entire world? Well, these are events that are more dramatic than a typical statistical model would predict, uh, not just in one country, but in all countries at the same time, not just in one asset class, but in 
all asset classes at the same time. And these are gigantic risk events for investors and for the economy because when all your assets are volatile at the same time, uh, this is a very uh, bad event for, uh, for your portfolio. So how could we detect these and how could we prepare for them? So in a recent paper, uh, Susanna Campos-Martins, who is at Oxford with uh, David now, uh, and I developed an approach to this problem, which is now implemented in VLAB and is kind of illustrates the kinds of pictures that I just showed you. So when many countries have high volatility at the same time, what it really means is that there is some event which shocked the, all the assets around the world and made their realized volatility substantially higher than it was predicted to be. And it's a multiplicative model, so this is percentage increase. So just briefly, there are two of these uh, data sets now in VLAB. One is for 48 different country ETFs, when the other is for 22 asset class ETFs. And the results emphasize the importance of these kind of compound risks. So um, what exactly are we talking about here? I mean, this is a, uh, an explanation which might be useful for some people and totally uh, unuseful for others. But if you think about having a whole vector of asset returns and trying to predict the covariance matrix of these returns, you end up using some sort of a multivariate Garch model or something like that. And you end up with uh, theoretically errors which would be uncorrelated across assets and constant variance uh, from a predictive point of view. But when you look at the residuals, they don't look like that at all. In fact, they sometimes are all bigger than expected. And so the question is, how do you build models that capture this kind of cross asset uh, dependence? And Essentially, what we're doing is we're going to create a, a latent variable X, which we call GeoVol, standing for volatility across the world, which tells you how different re volatility residuals respond. And uh, we're going to set up a, a, a version of this model which says that the covariance matrix of these squared residuals is, uh, has a factor structure. And this factor structure says, well, when this latent variable is equal to one, the factor disappears and you just have a diagonal model just like we expect a priori. But if this latent variable is bigger than one, and especially if it's much bigger than one, the off diagonal elements are really big, which is the way of saying that all these squared, all these residuals are big at the same time. Okay, I, the paper is not really about this. The paper is about, this is introducing the idea of the paper. And what do we get? We get some evidence as to how big these events are. And it turns out that the largest event we're seeing today is March 9th, 2020, which is almost the day that I showed you the, the red picture. And that's really a, an example of, of COVID. So one of the big risks for investors is COVID, but it was also a day when Saudi Arabia and Russia started an oil price war. So that has impl implications for climate change as well. The second biggest is Brexit. Third biggest is 9-11. Uh, uh, this is a precursor to the financial crisis, February 27th, 2007. And as you look down here, you see a variety of different things. Uh, here's another COVID event. You get Donald Trump's election. So some of these are what we would traditionally call geopolitical events. Um, but they all have the property that they move 
all these that they are very uh, important in moving asset prices everywhere. Okay, so how are we going to analyze these? Um, as you can see from this list, there are many different types of extreme risk. And there are some of these events which really would be in more than one category of risk. So how do we protect against these things? How do we do our risk management when we don't know what the factors are? We tend to do risk management one risk at a time, but maybe we miss things by doing that. So I'm going to take climate as kind of my main theme here. And we're gonna look at the risks from climate. And then we're gonna ask what happens if there are joint events, which are both climate and other things. So what are the risk mitigation strategies for investors in the climate literature? Uh, hugging a tree, I suppose, is one. Uh, so, there are, I, I just think, I think we, it's useful to think about four different goals that investors might have for uh, investing using in, in, in a world where climate change is an important risk. Uh, one is you just use the information that you have on not only characteristics of firms, but also characteristics of firms that are related to climate change. And this is really just a natural extension of a Markowitz kind of portfolio where you're doing your best to figure out what the risks and returns are and inform um, something like a, a mean variance portfolio. This is a minimal focus on climate risk, but it does change your portfolio if you have information on, on uh, climate exposures. Secondly, you might invest with a view that the market underappreciates the importance of climate change, in which case you're, you're taking a, a position which will uh, appreciate when the market figures out the truth that you actually uh, have in mind. Uh, typically, investing with a view is not, is not practical for uh, anything but uh, sort of hedge funds that are have a lot of potentially uh, well, very skillful uh, information uh, sources. So I think my preferred explanation, objective function is to hedge, is to invest to hedge climate risk, which is to go long companies that will do well in a world of substantial climate change and short those that won't do well. This is a kind of a strategy which will act as insurance to reduce your risk of consumption in the long run, but it also has the implication that it will lower the cost of capital for companies that are prepared for climate change relative to those that are uh, not prepared for it. Uh, the fourth category is to invest for impact rather than financial performance. So in this case, you're just trying to uh, subsidize companies that are doing things that you think are good for, I suppose, the planet in this case, but it might be uh, other, other goals as well. So I want to talk a little bit about these hedge portfolios, as I think that's a, a fairly credible objective function. Um, what's the asset pricing theory behind this kind of proposal? Well, it's clear that stocks which are risky are less desirable, everything else being equal, than stocks which are less risky. And so climate risk is one of the risks. So the stocks that are exposed to climate risk are less desirable. They should sell for lower prices in the market. And they have to have a positive risk premium, that is higher expected returns, in order to encourage people to hold that risk. So we would expect that stocks exposed to climate risk would have higher expected returns than stocks that are not. This is borne out by work by uh, Bolton and uh, Kaspersik uh, 
which I think shows this is in fact something that we see in the markets. Um, but of course, a hedge investor doesn't want to bear this risk. In fact, he wants to short, short this risk. So if you're going to short these companies that are exposed to risk and go long companies that are not exposed to this risk, then you're going to achieve a negative risk premium. And you would expect that the alpha of this kind of a strategy uh, would actually be negative. That says that this, your, your investment is, uh, is going to underperform the market on average. So this is not a good selling point for most uh, advisors. Uh, they, it's to tell, to tell your, uh, your investors that uh, you're gonna underperform the market, but you're getting a hedge out of it is exactly what insurance people are arguing. You have to pay for insurance. Let's see if we can make it as cheap as possible. But uh, asset managers are not comfortable with that strategy. And fortunately, there is another piece of this, which is that the market is pricing some form of climate risk probably, but if in fact there is news that the climate is getting worse, there's gonna be repricing of these portfolios, which will make the, uh, the, the uh, prepared stocks, the green stocks go up in value and the brown stocks go down in value. So you get positive returns on the hedge portfolio at this time. So the summary of this verbal asset pricing argument is that when there is little climate news, you would expect the negative risk premium would be the dominant feature. But when there is news, the market might reprice assets and the portfolio should have a positive alpha. And of course, if in the long run, the, the climate is, is much worse than the market currently expects it to be, you'd expect a substantial appreciation in your portfolio. And that's where the hedge comes in. So what do we see when we look at data? We've got a bunch of candidate portfolios, which we evaluate daily. These all have a climate credential. Um, and uh, yesterday, this is what VLAB showed. If you look at one year uh, alphas over all these funds, you see they're negative. Um, the three year alpha is on average slightly positive. Uh, and these are some different categories of funds fossil fuel free, low carbon, low environmental risk. These are ESG scores and sustainability mandate. This is what the firm says they're doing. And then there are some sector funds such as uh, you know, renewable energy and clean water and so forth. So, but basically all these funds are actually currently doing badly. I should say that a few months ago, these this column was all positive. So this is something that changes quite rapidly. The longer horizon, you see some positives here, but when you get to really exponentially weighted and, and long, they're almost all negative. So this is the, the negative alpha that, that these kinds of portfolios are wrestling with. So how would you build a hedge portfolio? Some of these managers maybe have done this, others may not have done it. And ways to do this are, first of all, to do fundamental analysis based on how you think climate change is gonna impact these different industries. And ESG data is often the way we do these kinds of fundamental analyses. ESG data is, uh, is often criticized, it's incomplete, it doesn't measure necessarily what you want. So there's a lot of work that a portfolio managers have to do to be effective at using ESG data to uh, produce these portfolios. There are some specialized assets which make this kind of fundamental analysis easy, such as carbon emissions themselves. If you invest in carbon emissions, you're getting something which actually is pretty correlated with uh, the intensity of, uh, of climate change. And you can now buy an ETF of uh, global carbon emissions futures, so-called KRVN, which we, uh, we actually 
are assisting in 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 the market not the marketing but of bringing this uh, to the market the other approach is rather than doing fundamental analysis to try to do statistical analysis and the statistical analysis recognizes that when there's news about climate change we would like to know which stocks are going up and which ones are going down and that's how you would form this portfolio and this was the theme of the paper that uh, I wrote with uh, Stefano, Giulio, Brian Kelly, Hebam Lee, and Johannes Strobel last year's RFS. So we're going to do something related to that, but slightly different. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not so easy to figure out how to construct climate hedge portfolios, and there are several strategies out there. One, we're going to do a two portfolio, two asset, two factor uh, climate model, one of which is the stranded asset portfolio proposed by Bob Litterman, which is basically long the S&P 500, short 70% of the returns on a coal ETF and 30% of the returns on uh, energy fossil. Well, this is all energy uh, stocks. So, it presumably does uh, well when these energy stock prices are going down and it does badly when they're going up, sort of like today. But it did well uh, last year when they were going down. The second portfolio is a factor mimicking portfolio, which is in uh, it's trying, trying to be written up by uh, Jean-Luc Denard, Brian Kelly and myself, where we want to form dynamic long only portfolios of these publicly available funds that I showed you. Now, all the, the average return, average alpha of all these publicly available portfolios is negative, but it doesn't mean that if you choose your portfolios well, that you might not have some positive alphas at different points in time, but it might be different portfolio, different assets would be uh, positive in there. So we want to choose a portfolio, a lonely portfolio of these assets, minimize the variance of this portfolio, but we want to maximize the correlation of this portfolio with uh, a news series. We'll hold it for a month and then recalculate. This is sort of the the math of it. We're going to regress returns on each of these portfolios against a news index and record the beta and then some other factors, which are investable forms of Fama French and, and, and strand, the stranded asset portfolio and so forth. And then we're going to form portfolio with weights, which are non-negative on the, all these returns. And these are gonna come out of an optimization problem, which minimizes a linear combination of the variance of the portfolio and a weighted average of the past betas that we estimated from this kind of a model. Um, and uh, there's some stuff done in this paper to try to figure out how do you actually estimate the, the variance over a short period of time for variance covariance matrix of all these assets. And there's a, a shrinking algorithm that's being used, which is uh, novel. Um, and this is, uh, this is what uh, Jean-Luc Denard has posed, put in the uh, journal Financial Econometrics. So what do we do? Well, here's what it looks like. It's been basically going up over time, although not always. It has different elements in it at different points in time. And if you look at all, and that picture is all out of sample. In other words, this is, this is, is the returns of the one month that you hold this portfolio uh, over time using past information to estimate it. And if you regress this portfolio on the news series, which is uh, called C tag in this case, you see it's got a, a positive and significant coefficient. These are the other factors we're using, which is the stranded asset portfolio, market factor, HML, SMB, and an oil return. 
um, you can see that the stranded asset portfolio is not at all uncorrelated with this. In fact, it's negatively correlated with uh, the factor mimicking portfolio. If you regress it, if you take out the new series and instead put a constant term in, you see you get a significant coefficient and this is now the alpha. And I'm, I'm also subtracting the risk-free rate in this case. So this portfolio ha does have a positive alpha. It has a correlation with the news and we think it is a climate factor portfolio. It's, it's climate factor because it's correlated with climate news. It's dynamic because we're re-estimating this thing over time. It's a minimum variance portfolio subject to the constraint that it be correlated with, uh, with the returns. And is this a physical risk factor? Well, there is a lot of interest in how you would invest for to hedge physical risks of climate change. Physical risks are ultimately what we're worried about. That's temperature change and, and drought and, and storms and all this stuff, wildfires. None of these portfolios have the word physical risk in them. And in fact, as people look at this, it's pretty hard to know how you would choose physical risk portfolios because physical risks have to be geocoded and stocks aren't really very localized. They have supply chains which are localized. They may have particular uh, plants which are localized and exposed. They may have business models which are exposed to climate change. So there are reasons to think that stocks are exposed and you only have to look at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric to see that the business models of some companies are very exposed to climate physical risks. But at least uh, we don't know how to do that. But my feeling is that this is actually the gold standard that Wall Street is looking for in terms of trying to find good portfolios. And if they, any of these portfolios turn out to be good at assessing physical risk, then they will outperform when there's news which is associated with the physical risks. And these will be, will enter into our portfolio. So I think it's possible that it has some physical risk exposure. And I could imagine over time, it would become more and more exposed to physical risks as there is more and more geo graphical data about where this, this is. Um, uh, this is just a, a, a little chart which shows you how complicated it would be. If you look at two hurricanes in uh, 2017, Harvey had its biggest impact in retail, then refining insurance, air transit, and banking, according to uh, uh, an analysis by Factiva. Irma, which was the same year, had its biggest impact on nursing care, electric utilities, air transport, insurance, and tourism. So even two different hurricanes hitting similar locations in the US seem to have different industry characteristics. It's a tough thing to try to price physical risk. Um, the stranded asset portfolio itself may or may not be actually a good measure of transition risk. I think it's a pretty good approximate measure of transition risk, but there are reasons to think that it won't always respond to that. I mean, it's, it responds to falling profits and stock prices for fossil fuel companies, in particular for coal companies. Well, today we see rising stock prices and profits for a lot of these fossil fuel companies because the, the, the demand for uh, oil and coal is, is going up. Um, so why is that happening? Well, one explanation is if the transition is actually done through regulation, that reduces the quantity of emissions, but it actually leads to higher and higher prices of 
of uh, energy stocks. And so if we think about the transition as being a carbon tax, this, I think the stranded asset portfolio looks very much like a transition risk portfolio. If we think of it as being regulation of fossil fuel emissions, it might not coincide. And I think that might be what we're seeing today. Uh, the performance in 2020 of this fund was really quite terrific. It had an alpha of 69% and the stranded asset portfolio had an alpha of 30%. So this complements a lot of work that's been done by investment banks, which say, oh yes, sustainability really did really well during the, the pandemic. And I think the answer is that the pandemic was a very severe form of transition. Uh, where the energy companies were devastated by the uh, re reduction in commuting, reduction in uh, air travel, and so forth, as well as other companies that, that had uh, damages as well. Um, this is just some data which shows that, this, that the energy sector has been underperforming in both returns and high volatility over the quite a few years, although this year is different. And uh, there was also a time in uh, 2016 when the return of the energy sector was high, but most of the rest of the year years, the return has been low, the lowest of all sectors, and the volatility has been highest of all sectors. So, what does this fund actually hold? Well, it's changing over time, but if you look at the, at the um, top holdings, uh, on average, the, the fund that was, had the highest average uh, role in this factor mimicking portfolio is this lithium and battery tech fund, but also, the, the solar ETF, which is widely used. And then you see some of these other funds, but the, the weights are really quite small on all of these, which suggests there's a fair amount of turn, turnover from uh, month to month. If you look at the end of the sample, you see these are the funds that are the highest. And if you look down here, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. there are just seven funds that are being held at the end. And one of them is really, has the, the biggest the biggest weight. 40% of the fund would be this Boston Common ESG Impact US Equity Fund. So this, but this changes over time. This is going to be available on VLAB uh, so you can see what the funds look like, what they're holding today and what they're holding later. So what uh, good are these climate factors? What do we do with them? Well, one thing we might do would be to invest in them directly. These are investable funds. You could do that. You could also invest in portfolios that have a high beta on these funds. And the VLAB website is going to show you all the, the betas on, on these two uh, climate factors uh, regularly, uh, very shortly. We could measure the risk and return of a hedge portfolio by looking at the volatility of that portfolio. And you can look at a GARTS model to see how volatile it is. And you can also use these portfolios to stress test banks by examining the impact on financial institutions of a change in these factor portfolios. Why does that matter? Well, if the factor portfolio shows substantial movement in, in uh, climate risk, then, then assets which are correlated with that are going to go down in value. And if, these, if the bank is holding a lot of assets with this kind of characteristic, then the asset value of the bank is going to go down. And this could be sufficiently important that it will lead to uh, financial instability in this bank. And if many banks are holding the same kind of 
portfolio, it's likely to lead to systemic risk. So this is the reason that central banks and regulators all over the world are trying to figure out how to do climate stress tests. And I'm going to show you our approach to how to do climate stress tests in you know, just a short amount of time. Um, so here's, here's what the volatility of this factor mimicking portfolio looks like. And you can see the volatility has gone up at the end of the sample period. Um, here's the strategy in a paper by uh, Heian Jung, Dick Berner and myself, which where we uh, try out this idea of calculating climate stress tests using uh, these factor climate factor portfolios. So we want to know how much would bank stock prices fall if the climate factor got worse. So this is a beta. And doing beta analysis of banks, portfolios, anything is pretty straightforward. It's the bread and butter of finance. So we want to calculate a beta. We want to do it dynamically, however, because we think that the that the market's view of the impact of climate and the portfolios held by banks change over time. So that these betas presumably would be changing over time. And then we can calculate capital shortfall based on uh, the same kind of calculation as we use for S risk to say how much capital would they need to raise if the climate gets worse in the way we postulate in order to get capital ratios back up to some uh, manageable level. So the key part of this, and really the only thing I'm going to talk about today is estimating the beta. We have a beta on on a climate factor and a beta on the market factor. And we estimate these using dynamic conditional betas, which takes account of the fact that both correlations and volatilities of, all of these three assets are changing over time. And so therefore the betas are actually changing over time. Um, so the stress scenarios that central banks have been working on are based on scenarios that come from the scientific uh, pathways to maintaining uh, temperature within a certain guide, within a certain level, typically one and a half degrees centigrade above above traditions traditional levels. Uh, we're using a rather different scenario. Our scenario is based on these factors. In other words how much movement in one of these factors could we really expect? How much should we protect against? And a simple answer to this is, let's look at how much these factors have moved over time. If they turn bad in the past, a certain amount, we might be asking ourselves whether that's, whether we're prepared for that kind of damages in the future, or maybe we should ask whether we're prepared for even more extreme damages in the future, but this gives us at least a benchmark. So what we do is we look at the six month return on and the stranded asset portfolio and look at the distribution over several, de several decades and look at the 1% point of this distribution. So this is the 1% worst performance of fossil fuel uh, stocks relative to the market over over the uh, last couple of decades. And that turns out to be a 50% drop in fossil fuel stock prices. So this is actually our stress. And I think one of the research questions is how does the stress like this compare with the kinds of stress, stresses that are being considered by, by uh, NGFS and, the, and central banks based on the various pathways to one and a half degrees. It might be that this is too mild a, a drop, but at least this is a drop which we have seen in the past. And we can ask whether this size of event would be dangerous for financial stability. Um, this is the picture of the six monthly return. 
and uh, I guess the and and various U.S. presidents. I think the worst outcome was uh, right here in in 2008. So that's more or less what we're we're considering as our stress scenario, and this is what we see for the betas of the U.S. banks, and they're all apparently moving sort of together, but there's a lot of movement, first of all. Second of all, if you look at this chart, here's zero. So if you go across at zero here, you see that while they're sometimes above, they're sometimes below, and you don't see a very systematic movement until you get to the end of the sample period, when it actually is going up quite substantially. If you look at the UK, you can see zero is way down here. So UK banks look like they actually have positive betas most of the time during uh, over the last, uh, well, decade, I guess. But it also shows this big rise at the end. Um, this is uh, France, you know, something, see something similar, or it's a little bit between uh, the US and, uh, in the UK. And we're in the process of doing this for the whole world. So you'll be able to see on VLAB at some point all of, the, all of these. So do these betas really coherently relate to the portfolios? So based on public information on the, on the holdings of the large banks, at the end of the sample period, you look at the US banks, Here's Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, USB, and so forth. These are their percentage of their loans that are active gas and oil loans. And you can see that if you plot that against the climate beta at the end of the sample, there is a positive slope. This is suggestive that the betas are actually picking up something in the, uh, in the portfolio of these loans. And of course, since this is public information, it's not unreasonable to think that the market actually knows about this. Uh, we are anxious to improve this and we're, we have access to the Fed uh, supervisory data because uh, Hayun, our, one of our co-authors, is now an employee at the, at the, in the research department of the New York Fed. And we have uh, offer of, of data from the European Banking Authority. And we have actually some primary data from Latin American banks, from the Inter-American Development Bank. So we have the ability to look more granularly and more over time at this kind of picture to see whether it's really coherent with uh, what the market price is. OK. Um, it's, I, I need to finish, but let me just say this framework can allow us to do compound risks as well. For example, you might expect whenever there is a big drop in energy prices, energy stock values, there could easily be a drop in the broad market as well. And so we might have a, a stress which would be a combination of a market downturn and an energy price downturn, which goes beyond what the market does. And so we would compare that by taking the same model and getting the exposure, the, what you expect the bank stock prices would be at T plus H would be what they are at T plus the exponential of the log change. And if you think that one of them is gonna go down 50% and the other one will go, uh, down to just 60% of its past, you, you get a stress scenario like this. It's a nonlinear effect, but you could do that. And if we are able to put in a, uh, a physical risk portfolio, we can actually ask about all parts of this. Um, and so one of the things that happens is that the capital shortfall that you calculate would have, could be calculated in three parts. One is, is the bank well capitalized today? And if, it's, if it needs capital already, that's part of the capital shortfall. 
And then there is a decline in the market cap due to the stress on climate. There might be a decline in market cap due to the stress on market prices. And these three would all combine to give you a total uh, impact. And for example, if you look, this is now Italy. If you look at the, at the total S risk of the banking sector in Italy, this is due to a market stress. You see that there is a, a capacity curve that we've estimated, which says, when is this really dangerous? It's dangerous when the S risk of Italy exceeds its capacity. And that has to do with not only Italy, but it has to do with the capitalization of the rest of the world. So there's a lot of pieces in that. So if you wanna add in climate risk to this, you'd get another curve. It'd be a little higher. At the moment, it doesn't look like it's a lot higher. It's just a little bit higher from stressing climate as well as the market. But that might be just enough to get the uh, push Italy over, over its capacity point uh, now at the, at the end of the sample. And so we don't know yet whether we think that climate is actually a serious risk factor for financial stability or not. But this is, I think, a tool that gives us a way of, of asking that question systematically and low cost and keeping track of it over time. Um, that's, so let me just conclude with a picture. Here's th Here are three of my grandsons looking out over a beautiful calm lake, wondering what's the planet gonna look like that they're gonna inherit. And I think young people are a little worried about this. And I think with good reason, because it's not really clear we're, we're doing a good job of preparing for this climate change, which I think is coming. And the tools that I've talked about are only just the beginning of what are, what are some of the things that could be done. But if we can tell them we have a good plan, it'll make them pretty happy. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. That's, uh... Excellent. So I'm, I'm delighted to turn to Lisa Tanaka, who's head of research at the Bank of England, and she joined it after completing her PhD, or DPhil as we call it, at Nuffield College. So it's a bit incestuous with a close friend and an ex-Nuffield student, but she's published on international policy spillovers, bonus regulation, and sovereign debt finance, but currently is more interested in prudential policies and, of course, the impact of climate change on the financial system. Over to you, Misa. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, David, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor to be discussing Professor Engel's uh, work on climate. And uh, I should mention at the outset, I'm no, not an econometrician, uh, even though I've been taught by David many years ago. So I will focus my discussion primarily on how Professor Engel's work could be applied to climate policies. We can, we can talk without the, uh, let, let me just talk through it without the slide in the case. Um, so I wanted to focus my discussion primarily on jail war and uh, serious concepts that Professor Engel introduced because both of these are very relevant for thinking about climate policies. So um, let me first talk about the jail wall uh, that Professor Engel introduced. So now that, that is basically a measure of, um, that captures the common variation in the innovation of volatility of assets. Um, and to model and measure jail wall over time, uh, Professor Engel and his co-authors use daily closing prices of up to 47 country ETFs, uh, including emerging and developed uh, markets. Now, um, I think the main advantage uh, of this measure relative to other measures that's been introduced for capturing, capturing geopolitical risk is that it only needs asset prices to compute, um, unlike other measures that rely on, say, textual measures. So they are very simple to compute. Uh, would you be able to go to the next slide, please? Um, so I only have two very simple questions. And the first one is, can jail wall be interpreted as a measure of geopolitical risk? And 
or, or is it more of a measure of unspecified common shocks to volatility of multiple assets? And um, it's interesting to note that um, some of the results are also a bit counterintuitive in that, for example, the flash crash uh, of or August 2015 has a bigger impact on jail war than uh, global financial crisis. My second question is also, if this is a measure of unspecified common shocks to volatility of multiple assets, then is there an application to measuring climate-related systemic risk, really, financial risk, but also systemic risk? Um, and it's interesting to know that in his paper, uh, none of the climate-related policy events uh, or weather-related events rank in the top uh, geo war events, although arguably Trump's election in 2016 was a climate policy event. Um, so what would be really interesting to see is whether uh, the authors could look at these major uh, climate events and see what kind of geo war they obtain and uh, to what extent they, are, they have been a system-wide event compared to other events they've identified. Could you please move to the next slide, please? Um, I found the climate stress testing paper very relevant and very interesting, and uh, they are certainly very complementary to the existing approaches, such as the one that's based on carbon price scenarios uh, advocated by NGFS or network-based approach uh, that's being advocated by Batistan et al. Um, I think the key challenge, well, key issue with the existing approaches is that they require very granular data on banks' asset exposures in order to compute the, the um, let's say, capital shortfall so in the, for individual banks. Um, by contracts, um, Professor Engel's approach is, uh, requires only uh, really equity prices and basic balance sheet data of banks. So what they do here is they compute climate, beat, climate beaters for large global banks, which is meant to capture the sensitivity of the equity prices of the excess, uh, of the excess returns of a stranded asset portfolio, which consists of fossil fuel firms. And then they use these climate beaters to compute C-risk, which is the expected capital shortfalls under climate stress risk. Um, so as I said, this is a very nice simple approach, which only rely on public data. So it's very useful complement to other approaches. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? So once again, I have uh, very high level questions on this. Um, and one question is, can we interpret climate beaters as capturing banks exposure to transition risks? And Professor Engel has just shown a chart which shows some, you know, some correlation between climate beaters and banks exposures to uh, oil and gas sectors, um, but the correlation is not very strong. And also um, I think it's, it's very possible that two separate shocks hitting both banking sector and fossil fuel sectors can give rise to, to, to these climate beaters. So for instance, the increase in 2000 that you see of climate beaters could be driven by the fact that um, a fall in energy prices coincided with a uh, rapid increase in, um, in uh, COVID cases across the world, which was also captured by uh, Professor Engel's uh, jail war venture. And the second question is how do regulators use this C-risk measure? And in particular, can we use C-risk measure, which is meant to capture banks' capital shortfalls um, against climate risk scenario as a way of calibrating tools such as capital requirements? Of course, stress tests are often used to calibrate uh, capital requirements for banks or like ask banks to raise more capital. Um, so far, regulators haven't done that based on stress tests, but can this measure be used by regulators? And I think here I have a few questions. Um, and one is that, um, of course, that the accuracy of that measure relies on markets pricing these risks accurately. And also, uh, to the extent that markets react to regulators' action, um, this might not be an appropriate measure for regulators to use to calibrate the tools. But I'd be very interested in hearing Professor Engel's thoughts on this. Um, and then the last slide, please. 
Um, so let me conclude here. So I think Professor Engel's contribution is very important for quantifying cl climate related transition risks, and they're very useful for us regulators to thinking about these issues. Um, and I think the key advantage really is that it relies on, you know, largely public data and doesn't require granular data. Um, I think the challenge here is how do we actually interpret interpret um, out output coming from purely statistical approaches like this? And to what extent can we as regulators use these approaches? Um, as Professor Engel also had alluded, my impression is also that um, much less progress has been made in quantifying physical risks and their understanding their implications for financial sector. And I think this is uh, an outstanding area of research where we would really welcome more work on. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that really more research is very much needed in quantifying both types of, types of climate related risks. And we have to be able to measure them at individual firm level and for the system as a whole. And I would very much welcome further research from Professor Engel, as well as other excellent researchers attending here today uh, on these topics. Thank you. Thanks, Misa. I think we give Rob a couple of quick replies and then take the questions from the Q&A. Rob, over to you. So I, I want to I thank you uh, very much, Misa, for a very nice discussion, very, a lot of helpful uh, suggestions and uh, it's actually direct pointing in directions where uh, we're really trying to go. Um, I think uh, actually David and uh, Susanna have a paper which is trying to look at at specifically at climate events using the geoval technique, mm -hmm. and I think that that's uh, that's pretty interesting. We're we're going to do the same thing with the. Uh, with the climate, with these 178 climate portfolios, but we haven't done it yet. Um, is the beta really transition risk? You know, pretty. It depends on what kind of transition you mean. I, you know, I think if we had put our carbon tax on, it would be a pretty good approximation to a transition risk. I, I don't know whether the kinds of transition risks, transitions that we're actually likely to have, are are uh, that accurately estimated by the by this beta um, and it's certainly true that when you estimate a model like this you ought to include betas on all the risk factors not just not just one or two which is what we have here and of course it's nearly impossible to think about how you would do with the same kind of dynamic process with you know, a hundred risk factors. I don't know how many risk factors you, you would really want to have. There is a sense in which using using a, a broad market index at least gives you some some uh, coverage for other risk factors. Um, and uh, can we use this as part of regulation? I mean, I certainly don't think you would want to. Uh, Use, use this instead of supervisory data for regulation because it's, it's, it is obviously statistical and, then, and statistics has standard errors and, and you're talking about dollars and cents for, uh, for banks and, and customers and so forth. But if I think so, I think it's, a, it's an important complement of to, uh, as you said, to to supervisory data. And if it agrees with supervisory data, then you have a little more confidence in the supervisory data. That I think a big issue is that this, because this is talking about market values and the market values of the assets, whereas a lot of the supervisory work is using book values of uh, what are, what's the book value of an asset on, that's on the bank's books going to be under this scenario. You don't get the asset pricing effects. You don't get forecasts of uh, expectations of what the transition time period is going to look like. You just have to make assumptions about it. So I think that there are actually important differences in the theoretical framework of these two approaches, which if you can get them reconciled, it's going to tell you you've got a pretty good handle on the risks of the banking sector. 
But so let me I just. Think Paul's looking doing this. Really worried about time, Rob. <laughs> yes, I'm out of time. Thank you. It's a, it's a very nice discussion. Thanks. Indeed. Paul, um, you're muted, Paul. He's gone, huh? And let, let me just uh, yeah. let me just say a few uh, very brief words um, just to conclude. Thank you very much. This is a really interesting session. And I'm sure we could have continued for for much longer to discuss the uh, the, the various uh, insights that we've seen into um, financial econometrics and climate risk factors. But thank you, David, Rob, and Lisa, for a really excellent final session. And this does conclude the seventh MMF. Um, policy conference series. Um, all the presentations from the previous speakers uh, will be available on video uh, and they all made excellent contributions to the theme of sustainable finance. They'll be on the MMF website shortly. Um, let me just close by saying thank you very much for uh, the work of Amit Kara, who did so much to, to put the uh, series together and for David Donagani, uh, Abling Managing Our IT. Um, so if you want to know more about uh, MMF activities, please do go to the website and especially uh, sign up to the um, to, to membership, which is free. Um, but but uh, otherwise, let me thank you for attending and um, for your uh, for your interest and um, hope to see you at future events. Thank you. Well, thank you thanks, Rob. Thanks, Misa. <laughs> thank you.